the DIT is the most important. It's digital imaging technician. Mm. Um, they're basically filing and making sure that we get all of our 4K footage or audio footage into one file. Very important. Well, somewhere around 2 a.m. in the middle of the night, he gets run over on Fifth Street. Oh and that puts him in the hospital. Um, and he's just now one year later. Um, But how do you go from that to your So Andy, how did you end up on this overhauling show? How did you end up doing that? So basically, it all began with a show called Car Warriors, which honestly I thought was a joke. I was at the shop at like 10.30 at night, and I received a phone call, said, hey, you wanna be on uh, you know, uh, national TV and, and uh, compete against the car building team? And I thought, sure, whatever, you know, thinking it was a joke. Uh, long story short, it, it, it wasn't. Uh, went over to Lubbock and did an interview to Hollywood, and uh, next thing you know, we were on a plane. The Car Warriors All-Stars take on a young, hotshot team from Lubbock, Texas. We brought a Texas-sized butt kicking. That's what I'm talking about. Just listen to me. And the challengers make a monumental mistake that leaves them one step away from total failure. It's an absolute major screw-up. Cut a hole in this hood, and I'll cut your neck. Car Warriors starts now. And so that was the beginning of TV for me. There was another one before that, wasn't it? Uh, no, Car Warriors was the beginning, and all it was was a 72 hour car build nonstop. Oh, Clock okay. starts, you got 72 hours to build a car. Well, we beat the California Pro Team. And that allowed me to go behind the scenes on that show and help them with a lot of things. And then that led to a show in Nashville, um, which is Search and Restore on Spike TV. Okay, okay. And we did a lot of, you know, building stuff for there. In fact, we filmed with uh, Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top. Oh, and, man, cool. So, yeah, yeah, good times. So that led you to uh, this thing with Jay Leno and Chip Foose. So talk about that. Yeah, so once I got on the uh, show Overhauling, they, they asked me to report to Huntington Beach, California, and I finished out the Lotus for the Jay Leno deal, and that's when Chip said, hey, you know, we need a full-time painter on this show, and you do body work as well, so how about you just finish this season out with us? Wow. And I said, I can do that, um, but I've got a business back home that I've got to take care of too, yeah. so I did a lot of driving back and forth. Wow. Yeah. But anyway, so we finished Overhauling um, doing that. So. Wow, wow. So... Driving from what, uh, L.A. or Hollywood or what, all the way yeah, back here yes. to Washington? Yes, I, w I would literally like, the show is so fast-paced that um, 
if we got like a four day weekend because of some holiday or something, say Thanksgiving, I'd literally unmic at 6 p.m. in Huntington Beach on set and get in a car and start. I'd sleep in a car somewhere in middle Arizona. Wow. And then come on in, spend, spend a day here and head back. So I thought it was, it was crazy how they would, uh, you know, they'd tell you, well, we, we need this car sanded, you know, patched and uh, painted in like 24 hours. Yeah, it, it, it was absolutely nuts. The original overhauling was based on seven days. And then when I came along, it was three-week builds, which is still really insane. Yeah. But that did allow us a little bit more time to, if you had enough personnel. If you guys haven't seen that show, it's, a, it's definitely a guy's show. Um, but there is, uh, you know, I, I really, uh, I, I found myself crying sometimes watching that show. Because I, the, the stories are just, you know, um, the people that couldn't afford to do their dream restore could get it done, you know. And um, I, I thought that was one of the best shows I, ever on cable. And, and it's actually still on uh, all, uh, different times on, uh, yes. on different channels. I, yes, they, they so. show. I have people all the time that will send me a screenshot of their TV or something. You know, like, yeah. hey, overhauling's on right now, you know. So they're doing a lot of reruns on that. What, still what channel day. is that? Well, you know, they were doing it on speed, discovery, and mainly velocity. Okay. And now I think it's showing on like a motor trend type it's deal. All so. an elaborate ruse. First, I'm going to bring them up the escalator to the second floor. And then we're going to go into the Hollywood gallery and around the corner to meet Barry McGuire. And now that Bernie is here, the A-team, Chip, Jesse, and I hide in a nearby stairwell. Our production team is posing as Barry's crew and invites Bernie to join Barry for an interview about cars. Like, what else would they talk about? Welcome back, everybody. We're here at the Peterson Automotive Museum in Los Angeles, California, hanging out with car guys, the really cool ones. Pete, Bernie Fetterman. Bernie, nice to meet you. Pleasure to meet you, sir. And I'm so happy that you're here. Yeah. Let me get this right. You're a, you're a pastor. I'm a pastor. And you're a car guy. I'm a car guy. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that. It doesn't get much better than that. You have faith and horsepower. <laughs> that's yeah. right. That's right. Do you have anything cool in your garage these days? Uh, well, right now I have a 67 Camaro. Did you check the one right behind us here? I saw it when I came in. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. We're going to have the builder out in a couple of minutes. Yeah. yeah. So what you're working on now? You Any part of the car you're working on? Uh, I, yeah, my family's been working on the interior for me, so I don't really? know what really? all's happened. The builder of this car is going to be our next guest. Okay. And there's a great interior inside this one as well, but the whole car is. I'd like great. to see it. We'll have the builder come out and then you'll get okay. to meet him. Okay. Because he's a Camaro lover. Good. Yeah. And so maybe I can get you guys together here. How you doing, Bernie? Hey, it's Chip Foos. <laughs> Did you check out your headliner yet? Does that make any sense? We have a little bit of a surprise for you. It started to make sense. Congratulations. I got, I got to shake your hand when you were in Lompoc at Cabrillo. I remember at the, car, the show. car show. Yeah. And you had your car there. I had my car there. Yeah. Now it's here. Well, guess what? Oh, my God. Guess what? <laughs> Bernie, you're on overhaul. <laughs> Is this it, man? Yeah. That's your car. Oh, my God. Wow. Are you, this is really mine? This is not. This is yours. This is your car. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. So what's Chip Foos like? Um, he's, the guy can draw. We all know that. That's the one right. thing about him. It is insane how well he draws. Um, you know, he wasn't on set a ton. He comes in, he does his drawing, and he gives us that drawing and tells us, hey, make this happen. And then he'll come in and do a few things uh, a couple hours a day or whatever. But um, he's a great guy. Um, definitely, definitely has a passion for cars, for sure. When, when he would do these drawings, is that, because uh, on the show, you know, it appears like, you know, maybe a period of like 30 minutes that he did. Yeah, is yeah. that about right, or is it a little bit... Yeah, so it'll all be pre-planned, and then the sketching will begin under camera, um, and, and of course in post, they speed that up a little okay, bit. But, okay. but a general drawing normally in an, in an hour, um, really? especially if it's got interior shots and stuff, he usually does in you know, an hour and a half, two hours. Wow, man, yeah. that's insane. It is. Pretty cool with a marker. Yeah, yeah. Well, man, we, we lost Jesse Combs uh, several months ago. I understand that you were pretty close with her. Yeah, Jesse Combs was a great tribute to Overhaul, and she actually came on pretty much when I did. So we were the newbies, so to speak, mm -hmm. on set. And that's where I think her and I built a good relationship because we were kind of new to set. Um, a great girl, very knowledgeable, very passionate about the industry. Um, I enjoyed her.
How did you come up with Marfa, the idea for Marfa? So I took a trip down to Marfa one time because I, I don't remember. I heard about the Marfa lights from somebody. And I like that sort of stuff, that kind of a, you know, mystery type of thing. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to drive down there one weekend. So I did. And I went down there and I, I'm very skeptical of things like this. In fact, I wasn't really expecting to see the Marfa lights. And I did. I went out there to the observatory, which sits about four miles outside of town there. And sure enough, I mean, it, it, they've got weird lights that show to appear up on the horizon. Uh, they change colors. They float. They move. Um, it's strange. I don't know. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. So I thought, as far as the movie, I thought, you know, why hasn't there been a movie written Mm. about this phenomenon. I mean, Unsolved Mysteries back in the 90s came in there and did an episode on that. And I thought, right. well, wow, there needs to be a, a movie with a twist, so to speak, on this. So right. that's where this all developed. Yeah, I, when I researched uh, Marfa just for the this interview, I, I couldn't find a lot about it. I mean, there's just not very much information. There's not very good footage. Uh, the footage, most of it is shot back at the observatory area or whatever and you know people don't have the best equipment or whatever and so there's just not been a lot of information about it um so how much of this movie was filmed in marfa yeah so marfa itself is a crazy backdrop for film for the film industry in fact the cohen brothers loved it they filmed you know no country for old men uh down in that area mm -hmm. kevin bacon's currently filming a show down there um a lot of Hollywood is down there. The movie Giant, for instance, back in the oh, 50s. Okay. Yeah. Um, but long story short, Martha is, <laughs> it's weird. It's strange. It's very artsy. Um, Tom seems to almost inevitably stand still down there. Mm -hmm. And so we filmed about three days of Martha, which would equal on screen, on screen time, probably maybe 20% of it is actually filmed in the community. And then the rest of it's filmed pretty much in Plainview. Yes. Right? So Plainview being 15 miles from me and having certain streets that kind of match that old, you know, West Texas town decor, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. um, Marf, uh, or, or, sorry, Plainview um, is looking very forward to being into the film industry, especially when we had, you know, Leap of Faith back in right. the early 90s filmed there. Um, and so that being the case... Plainview is very hospitable about this. In fact, Stelio Cervante and Tony Todd talk about that in another interview. Plainview was very open-armed about this right. and very welcoming. And along with that, also your businesses, you know, like the Broadway Brew and uh, all of your different antique shops down mm -hmm. Broadway there. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like um, if you've seen Hell or High Water, uh, that movie is filmed in West Texas. Yes. I can't remember the towns, but you, but they all look like a typical... Western, you know, t West Texas town. You know, they have the same type of architecture, you yes. know, the brick streets. And, um, and you know, something to add to that, you think about, you take California, the state of California, you do not have any town there that has that old early American town, the brick mains and the, mm -hmm. that is unheard of in the state of California and for a lot of this country. So it's neat to be able to bring this film into that small brick, you know, layered main street um, that Plainview has. So how did the filming process go in, in Plainview? Absolutely smooth. Um, our very first setting was with Tony Todd and it was on the rooftop of the fair building there okay. on Broadway. Really cool. Um, that's where our first battle on screen between the two who basically have opposing sides in this film mm. take place. That's where we introduce the mayor of Marfa, which is Tony Todd, and uh, their conflicting interests of what's going on here in the town takes place at the very beginning on the roof, roof top of the fair okay. So I understand there was uh, some kind of... Um uh, an accident or something that happened. Yeah, so behind the scenes, Marfa was plagued with all kinds of stuff, from Tony bringing two left shoes to wow. you name it. Oh my but our, our biggest event, um, which was tragic, both on him as a human being and, and production for a little while, and that is our DIT. The DIT is the most important. It's digital imaging technician. Mm. Um, they're basically filing and making sure that we get all of our 4K footage or audio footage into one file. Very mm. important. Well, Somewhere around 2 a.m. in the middle of the night, he gets run over on Fifth Street. 
Oh my goodness. And that puts him in the hospital. Um, and he's just now one year later, um, recovering from that. He's walking again, not working, but walking. Um, so he's went through a lot of recovery. His name is Caleb Stevens and a big shout out to him as well for what he's went through. But long story short, in the middle of the night that night, we had to fly in a new DIT and the closest we could get was North Carolina. Wow. So yeah, movie magic, man. (laughs) My goodness. My goodness. Let's talk about some of these actors in this movie. So we have Tony Todd. Talk about Tony Todd. Tony Todd is amazing. And that's when you see experience of acting coming to the screen. Um, You know, when he called me down to his uh, trailer the very first day of filming with him, um, he he said, Andy, come on down to the trailer real quick. He called me on my cell phone. He said, let's discuss this character that you wrote. And when we got in there, he said, dude, I gotta be honest with you. It's one of the most challenging characters that I've had in my career. And I thought that was really cool of him. Um, but to watch him step into that personally for me in that trailer that morning was amazing to see him actually blow life into that character. And, and I'm going to tell you something about him that was really funny one night. After about, four, uh, after about two or three nights of filming with him, we were standing in the dark out in the middle of nowhere. And we were filming out in a ravine. Uh, a very important it, actually it's the ending scene of the film and it just occurred to me that I'm standing out in the pitch dark in the middle of nowhere with Candyman Correct. and I looked over him at him and I said uh, Tony you know what and he goes what man I said I just realized I'm standing in the dark out in the middle of nowhere with Candyman it's kind of creepy and he kind of looked at me and goes you're just now realizing that man right he's funny he's a great guy um, unbelievable actor Right, and he was also in uh, the movie I remember him for is um, uh, Des- Final Destination. Yeah, Final Destination. He's Candyman. in a couple of those, isn't he? Um, yes, and I think currently on Netflix there's a series called The 100 or something that he is okay. briefly in as well. Okay, okay. Stelio Savanti. What can you tell me about him? What was that that experience like working with him? I've got to give a lot of credit to this man. Stelio Savante has really uh, been an asset, Um, even in pre-production. In fact, he's come on as a producer of this film. Um, He has helped me take this to a level that I probably on my own, well, I know I wouldn't have been able to get it to. Um, He has helped develop this in in pre-production production and now in post-production and he's a key element in getting this film to you know different avenues of distribution as well so and an amazing actor unbelievable uh and such a great guy he's funny on set still he's a cool guy and uh this is a guy that uh, does the voice of ajax on call of duty that's correct correct. yes Um, and a lot of people recognize him for that yeah, is for yeah. the call of duty. Bound. Three neutralized. Nine bang. Chips. Nine bang inbound. Incoming hellstorm. Contact battery. Enemy ROV. Trophy going out. Concussion going out. Killed firebreak. And he voice overs during the entire film. So that's kind of cool. Estelio coming from Ajax from Call of Duty. Okay. Your Call of Duty fans can listen to Ajax basically right. um, narrate this entire film. I start this movie off on a real event, and that's called the Terlingua Cook-Off. And they're coming back from that, and Terlingua is a town, in fact, you used to walk into Chili's restaurants, and there used to be all these, you know, Terlingua Cook-Off awards, you know, they'd have hanging all over the walls. And so these four are coming back from that area. They stop into a, man, a very dilapidated uh, gas station that seems like it hadn't had a customer in years. And when they walk in there, it's creepy, it's weird, they're weird. And a guy at the counter, played by Richard Ryle, tempts them with basically a fortune-telling ticket. But he tells them, maybe one shouldn't mess with their fate. Maybe they shouldn't know their future. However, one of the four pulls a ticket. The problem with this film, or the storyline is, is she didn't read it. And that's where things get crazy. Okay, okay. And Richard Riles, of course, is a guy that's just been in hundreds and hundreds of movies. I'm a big uh, Richard Riles fan. he was in one of my favorite movies of all time, Glory. Uh, he's a uh, 
uh, I forget what they call the guys, and um, I'll, I'll think of it later. But yeah, uh, I haven't personally seen that movie. You know, like he's in Joe Dirt, and I mean, it's, yeah, he's one of those yeah. guys that's been in man everything. What the hell is wrong with you people? I... Um, I understand that uh, we had some local talent involved in that uh, Cotton Center. Thanks. Yeah, Brittany Alvarado. Shout out to Cotton Center and to Brittany uh, yeah, Alvarado for sure. Unbelievable. I could not believe this. So when I first did a casting call months, probably eight months, probably before filming, um, we had over, man, it was like 3,900 people apply. It was insane. I could not believe it. Great turnout. And so I, what I did was I gave them a small section for the character they were applying for, like a dialogue from the film. And it was their job to tape themselves, record basically an audition and mail it back to me. And I narrowed it down finally to 250 um, uh, auditions. And then I started narrowing it down to about like five for each role. Wow. And out of nowhere, and the whole time I'm going through there, when I get it narrowed down, I noticed this girl that applied has an 806 area code, same as ours. And I said, whoa, whoa, what's, what's going on here? So I called her and she said, yeah, I actually know you. I, I live in Cotton Center. <laughs> like, wow. That's cool. Oh my gosh, you know, 25 miles away. And I'm going to tell you something. She was, this is her first feature film. Most people who act go through a ton of short films and a lot of right. s stuff before they ever get here. Hollywood was nervous about this. <laughs> right. They said, Andy, are you sure yeah. about someone who has not stepped into a major role before or in a feature film at all and then playing a major role on top of that right. I said I'm telling you we have had Scott calls we've worked hard with her and she promised me that if I would just trust in her she would not let me down mm -hmm. she was spectacular even Stelio Savante Tony right. Todd and all of them were impressed and said you know you, you, you did right Andy she, she actually nailed it she was amazing here we go and you also had this uh, Tracy Perez. Yes. Who's been in a lot of things in Hollywood. She's most famous, Tracy Perez is, for a series on Netflix. It's got like 57 episodes, and it's called Los, An Los Angeles High, I believe. We had a lot of people in Hollywood apply for these roles. It was, it was mm -hmm. insane. And whoever was taking that role ended up, it didn't work out. Timing was off. She couldn't step in. And that happened literally three or four days before filming. So I'm a nervous wreck as a director and writer of this film. We get a hold of Tracy Perez, or actually her, her talent um, agent contacts us. Says she can step into the role, let her have it. So we saw an audition over and I was like, ah, she's pretty good, you know? But what was amazing to me, and I was a nervous wreck because I was like, how is she gonna learn? I mean, this is a role that is like major. A lot of, she has more dialogue than anybody in the film. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I'm like, how is she going to remember right. all of her lines? Well, as a new director, I learned something. It's not like a play. Um, where a play, you learn all of that. You memorize your lines. Acting in a major feature film is not that way. They learn literally minutes before. they Before we act the scene out, they learn just what's happening in that scene. My goodness. She was amazing. Yeah. She stepped in and took the role of Allie Hollowell, which is this kind of a smart aleck, one-liner, witty kind of person, right. and she nailed it. It's mm -hmm. unbelievable how well she did. Kyle Colton. Yes, Kyle Colton's been in a lot of different uh, uh, feature films, independent films. Um, this guy was unique. So he took on the role of Matthew Bench, one of the four that's, that this film is mm -hmm. about, the four friends, and how their journey and their friendship is gonna tra basically change over the course of this film. Right. This guy here, what I loved about him, <laughs> some of his best lines, and I've actually left some of that in the film. When we would basically just be filming the scene, we'd let the camera continue to roll a little bit to give us a tail end. And this guy would say stuff that was absolutely hilarious. And so he was just naturally funny, um, which is what that character's about as well. He's basically the opposite of Eric Street, his friend in this film. Eric's a lot more serious, going through a lot more changes. So this guy is the lighter side of life. Kyle did a good job doing that. Well, let's talk about that uh, uh, Eric character that played by Marcus John. Yeah, this guy here, um, when I saw his um, audition reel, 
um, I knew he was going to be my Eric Street. He nailed it. And I'm like, you're in, man. Um, he is naturally funny as well, but he had to play a more serious role in Marfa and did a good job because he's the one that is sensing something changing. Something's mm. going on here in this town. What is it? And he, and, and he he's not saying much, but there's a lot of things in this movie that are Easter eggs that are giving him a hint mm. as to something weird is happening here. Right. Okay, so then we have another Texas actress. Her name is Kimberly Pember. Kimberly Pember had an amazing reel. We had a lot of people apply for that role as well. I had a hard vision between her and one other. They were both really, really good. I had leaned toward her. Um, I had some other people lean towards the other. We flipped a coin, and she's what come up. And I couldn't be more thankful for the side that that coin landed on. She was amazing. She's got a Marilyn Monroe look. And when, yeah. you, when you finally see this film, you're going to understand that that's actually kind of cool because she's the front line of Marfa. Um, yeah. She's the first people meet. She's, I would call her the mother of Marfa. Because when the four come into town and they sit and they walk into the Broadway Brew, um, which is the, the Marfa Diner, they sit down and she's the first one that they meet, first one that she speaks to. And she's already dropping hints okay. of things happening. And she is amazing. Neil Sandylands. Yes. Neil. Him and Stelio both are from South Africa. They're both amazing, at both human beings and actors. Uh, Neil is something else. <laughs> this guy's a character. The first time I talked to him, he was going to step into a role that's called, and of course he's from The Flash, plays the thinker. Uh, this guy, talk about somebody who can blow life into uh, a character that you've wrote. He plays Norman, which is a guy that's basically tired of all the town, all the things going on in town, and he's basically become, <laughs> he's the town drunk really that sits at a bar, mm. um, which the bar is actually the Broadway Blue Brew here in Plainview. This guy, when I talked to him on the phone one night, he begins to speak to me in Afrikaans. And I didn't know what it was. I was like, dude, what are you saying right now? He goes, oh, dude, it's my native language, bro. It's, it's called Afrikaans. I'm like, okay. And he was doing a poem in it. I said, I tell you what, hold on, hold on a second. What if at the bar in the movie, when anytime you get mad at the waitress or whatever, what if you just all of a sudden just went off into your native language and spoke Afrikaans? And so in this film, he does that like once or twice. And it's just, it's funny, it's odd. And right. that is Neil. He is wonderful. So then we have this character right here, and this is a really cool guy that's been in uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Yes. Um, what else? Uh, wasn't he in the um, Mike Myers? Yeah, uh, your Austin awesome Powers. Yeah, yeah. Um, Martin Kleba. <laughs> this guy is packed full of more energy than anything I've ever seen. <laughs> it was like we had a wind-up toy. And we just set it down on the street, and it just took off. It was, air, it was there, it was there, it was there, it was there. And I was like, dude, relax. And I mean, just to get him to calm down to film his scene <laughs> took energy on my behalf. Um, so he plays, very briefly, a character um, that is basically the festival. We have this festival in there. It's a Day of the Dead festival. And he's basically in charge of security there. <laughs> kind of an irony. And um, when he showed up that day, I didn't know this, but when he showed up to film that morning, he turns around, he looks at me, he goes, so guess what my character's name is? I named it myself. I said, what? And he had a badge printed and it said A wow. dot Stap. Nice. So he named his character after me. And in the film, if you look very closely, he has that lapel on his chest. So now what you have to do to continue the tradition is the next movie that you make is have a character in there that has a badge or something that has That's A true. Stap on it. That, would be, like that would be that, funny. So, the guy, uh, what Stan Lee from uh, that wrote all the comics in all his oh, yeah. movies, he's uh, I guess he's in almost every one of them. Yeah, he plays basically yeah. a cameo in the yeah. background of everything. Yeah, um, and I hope I get that opportunity, Adam, to do that. Um, I'm I'm looking forward to doing. Uh, I, I think you're gonna, man. Um, I hope. I, I think uh, you're going to be doing a lot of things. So Martha's either the beginning or it's the end. Yeah, right. <laughs> so then you have. Uh, Lisa Romaine. Yes. Lisa Romaine was amazing. She literally flew in one day, filmed three or four scenes, and flew out. She wasn't here long. Um, and, of course, she has some history on uh, the movie by James Cameron, Avatar. Okay. Um, 
she was a lot of fun. She's funny and she's she's just uh, easygoing on set, which is, which is the type of personality you need. And she stepped into the role of Zoe, which was written literally maybe 15 days before we started filming. I, I wrote that role. Um, because I felt like the hitchhiker needed to, at some point in his life, settled possibly in Marfa and gotten married. Okay. And so that's what that role is. Well, everybody can go to Marfa, MarfaMysteryMovie.com to see all the different uh, actors and people that are on the set. Uh, we can't go through every single one of them, but... Um, Talk to me about the process of creating a movie. Um, what is, how do you go from, uh, and I, I'm sure there's a lot of people wondering, you know, like, how does this guy from, from Lockney, Texas, you know, family business, painting cars, gets a show, you know, gets on a show, but how do you go from that to your, you, I mean, because the way this thing went down was, uh, the way I understand it is, is you got to go to do the movie and all of a sudden you're in charge of this big project and you just had to pick your pants up and just go with it. Yeah. Um, long story short, when I first wrote this film, um, and, and, and let's just start with the very beginning of writing a film. So you start with an idea, that's your seed. When you have this idea, you start to write a story and create something off of it. Of course, that alone is going to go through 200 changes. Okay. Um, but the biggest challenge is writing your characters. Who are they? How do they react? How would they handle things? How would they say things? And so, and every character needs to be different. The key to success, and I hopefully, hopefully success here, is that somehow in every feature film that we watch, we need as an audience to relate to one of those characters. And I think in Marfa, because it is very character rich, there's like 15, that you will find somebody that you love in this film that you can connect to, and it'll make you love this film. Because in the end, Marfa sends a good message, but we gotta go through the Twilight Zone to get there, which labels it a dystopian uh, sci-fi. Um, after we wrote the characters, then I started learning basically that now, how, is, how are people gonna see this film? Mm -hmm. In other words, I now needed to look through the eye or the, the lens of the camera. And as a director, that's what you've got to do. You've got to be able to focus 100% on the art of what this film is gonna play out, how it's gonna look on the big screen. And so that was the next challenge. Filming, making a movie, I underestimated it, as most people would. Um, when I first got this film and decided I was gonna do it, I literally was gonna do it with a DSLR camera and a pretty good audio and some decent lighting and we right. were gonna make this thing work. I literally had budgeted this at the start for maybe, maybe $30,000. Yeah. Was I wrong? Yeah. <laughs> but what happens is we start picking up a bigger actor. Mm -hmm. Well, then I'm like, well, crap, man, I can't, you know, I can't slow down now. And this became a snowball because we had so many different people in Hollywood applying. It was crazy. And Andy McDowell was the one that I was talking about earlier that had applied for, yeah. um, I believe, the, uh, the role of Zoe. So this is crazy oh, wow. who it attracted. Yeah. Um, but it picked up and started snowballing. It's like one of the deals like you can't cut dollars now and you can't cut time. Right. We got to do it right. So it's been a learning experience. So you go to the you go to Hollywood uh, production company or something, and you just kind of throw this thing out there and say, you know, here's what I, this what I envision, and you basically sell them this idea, don't you? Yeah. Well, so how it happened, literally. Okay. So if you write a screenplay, even if it's a good one, the problem is is ever getting it filmed. The way Hollywood works, you've got all these production companies, and they have a, a small board so to speak, that goes into like your um, the Writers Guild. And there is files and files of genres of films or screenplays. And they go through them, well, I like this one, I like this one. So literally to get your film or your screenplay ever to the big screen, it's tough. I decided I was gonna do this on my own. And so that's why I'm the sole executive producer. Yeah. But what happened yeah. and what helped was, it began to gain attraction. We had several different agents throughout Hollywood from Buffy to uh, Vampire Slayer to um, all kinds of people that were calling. And so what happens, I guess, is that when it gets on the desk of one, it gets on the desk of many. Mm -hmm. And so this spread like wildfire. And next thing you know, it's it's being introduced into um, a lot of different websites and newspapers across the world. Italy, China, Russia, wow. matter of fact, um, everywhere. It's been insane. So when you hear these actors, they talk about, I got this script and I just fell in love with it. 
And so you have them coming to you. And you talked to me in, uh, earlier about that uh, a lot of this now is just done right over the internet, right? Yeah, I particularly did everything via Skype. Yeah. And the reason why is I wanted to work with each of my actors one-on-one. -on -one. Sure. But here's the problem. Even though they all are good at their individual part or role, that doesn't mean that they work together well chemistry-wise sure. um, as a whole. So we did two or three meetings via Skype as an entire, and we went through the very beginning of the movie to the end, and we acted it out via Skype. Wow. And that's when I realized the chemistry's good. We can now film, because normally, you really want to put your eyes on these people in person, shake their hand, meet them, let them meet each other, and let them warm up. Um, so we did something kind of unique, and we did that via the internet. That is pretty pretty cool. So, I seen a uh, thing where uh, Breaking Bad cast. It's on YouTube. You can watch it. But they're sitting down the whole team and like three or four tables all around reading their parts for the yes. next week. Yep. You talked about uh, this process of writing this thing and how you had to kind of change some things and mix things up on the fly. Yeah. Because it, the way that you wrote it out originally is doesn't necessarily play out once you start the cameras and and things like that. You will write a movie three times, okay? When you finally get your screenplay to where you've locked it, you're done, and you're one hundred percent happy with it. Well, guess what? You've you wrote it once in pre-production. You're going to rewrite it again when you start filming in production because things are going to change or you're going to see something visually. And then in post, of course, you may change the order of things, the order of scenes, the way things play out. So you literally write a film three times. Oh, that's just crazy. It's nuts. <laughs> it, you know, and then you're talking about the guys are, are you know, looking at their, their uh, script or what have you right before they even shoot. Yeah. Um, you had talked about that one of these actresses, and I can't remember which one it was, but she literally arrived on set. You hadn't even met her yet. My first phone call with her, I, I'm not joking, was she was on her way to the L.A. airport to wow. fly into Texas and take this film over. And I was a nervous wreck because this yeah. this is honestly the role with the heaviest dialogue. Sure. And I was just like, in my was mind... Was that Tracy Perez? Tracy Perez. Yeah, okay. And in my mind, there was no way she was going to be able to do this. Right. Man, did she prove me wrong. When you when you watch her on film play Ally Hollywell, her, her care, her, the way she expressed things and her facial expressions and stuff like that just really sells that character. She's amazing. And she's really the beginning of what kind of... In fact, in the end, she makes a statement like, oh my gosh, I caused this, you know, um, because she pulled that fortune ticket uh, in the very okay, beginning. Okay. So. so you just give these guys the, their scripts and uh, they, they don't sit there and practice together uh, or anything like that. They come on set. Today we're filming this, this, and this. Yeah. Right? Isn't that kind of how it works? And then so they have to... <clears throat> bring the life into the character right there on the spot, just out of nowhere. They, they, they do. You know, the thing is, you can write a character all day long, and you can write it in depth to where it's, it's, it's a very well-rounded character. The problem is you got to have somebody actually step into that. And you'll know the difference immediately, especially through audition reels, if a person can do that or not. Mm -hmm. And so I was real careful with that. And these people literally, I mean, scene by scene, they would look at their part and go, okay, so this is what I gotta say during this scene, and here's how it plays out, here's the gist of that scene. And then when we would yell, you know, action, I was just amazed to be looking at my director's monitor and watch something you wrote and the characters come alive on that screen. It, it's, I, I don't know how to explain that. It's just, it's unreal. And it's, it's, it's so real. And I just never, what I wrote and envisioned, they took it to the next level amazing what actors can do so where are we at right now so the movie's done um <clears throat> where, where are we at currently the film so there's we're, we're close really in post we're going on nine months i think in post now which means we're on schedule so where we're at right now is i decided since we filmed this in 4k we went ahead and stepped up our game so we filmed it in 4K, and I thought, well, if we did that, we really need Adobe, you know, or a, a, a Adobe surround sound. Sure. So we're now currently having audio layered uh, in Dallas, Texas, at a studio, and then they'll they'll put it into 5.1 surround sound. Um, 
So that is currently being done, and really there's only two more steps, and that is color grading. And that's basically where they take a film like a coloring book, and they individually go back and, and color this film how I see fit. Now, this film here, I want that Mad Max, very over oversaturated color look, like almost unreal. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason for that. Um, and then our very last step, really, along with color grading, is Stelio and I, which is the voice of this film, we are, f are uh, currently uh, starting his voiceover. Okay. So that we can layer that on top of this so he's yeah. working on that right now, then. Yes. So I've been I've been writing his lines, and then he's already started wow. recording some of that. that and so and as we record some of that, we start realizing that you know I need you to tell more of the story. So in this scene here, let's do something there. So so like I said, we're rewriting yeah. the film as we speak. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Nine months in post. So we'll get this. Uh, you're, you're getting the the, the post production stuff done. Your color grading, <clears throat> uh, voiceover. Uh, how long? Uh, till we see something and is it going to be an electronic package you know like the Netflix kind of thing or is it going to be something that's in the theaters all over the country or yeah so um, I think we're literally eight weeks away from having this film complete and what I will do personally is and uh, Alamo Draft House in Lubbock is excited about this we will actually have um, a premiere there and I'm hoping to do that say after July 4th like midsummer and um We'll do kind of a movie party, you know, where you'll get a couple of things issued at the door that pertain to the film and are in the film. And uh, But as far as actual distribution, that depends on the distributor. And right now we're in weird times because not only do our younger generations not really go to theaters, streaming has become larger. And yeah. now currently with our situation we've got as far as this coronavirus deal, you're now yeah. seeing movies that were built for the theater going straight to streaming. Yeah. And I just currently heard a week ago, in fact, Stelio called me on this and said, look, Netflix and all your other streaming right now, they are they are looking to buy up and soak up as much material as they can. Oh, I'm because sure. Because people are at home. Yeah. And that being the case, that's why we're trying to get this finished up so that we can have that electronic package that can go immediately into streaming. Sure. But when, I don't know. We're, we're talking um, basically 2021, aren't we? Yeah, 2021 is, is what I'm thinking. Realistically. Uh, yeah, because uh, normally a film will go through its avenue of film festivals. Um, we couldn't make 2020 because the deadline was October of 2019. Well, we weren't ready. Um, and we may or may not have to use the film festival market. We don't know. A lot of films, even if they can pick up distribution, they still want to do the film festival because that's where you pick up awards and awards are important to the person who wrote that film or directed it or you know whatever so I, I don't know i don't know but 2021 more than likely yeah yeah this whole coronavirus thing is changing everything by the minute In the making of this film, one thing that I do want to do personally, and that is to thank the 806 area for helping us film for Marfa, Texas, five and a half hours south. Um, Plainview, thank you for um, allowing us to come in and film. You've got a lot of neat backdrops for the movie industry, being that you know brick town, mortar top, uh, small town America. Um, each business was very um, hospitable to us. And I appreciate that. They gave us everything we needed from security with police department or whatever. So thank you very much for uh, what you did for this film.